Well, let's face it. There are lots of other things that you could do on Sunday morning besides being here at this service either in person or on Zoom. You could be out hiking, playing golf, working in your garden, or reading the New York Times with a wonderful cup of coffee. There are also places and times where you could get some of the parts of what happens here week after week in this gathered community. There are weekly lectures you could attend, talks on Zoom and the like. And yes, you could engage with the values you believe in by just doing some volunteer work at this hour. Or you could just treat Sunday morning like any other morning of the week and just follow a regular daily schedule as many people have come to do. This practice of observing a Sabbath, a seventh day, and coming together for weekly worship is ancient, one handed down to us from many, many of the world's religions. In some conservative traditions, it's considered a sin not to attend the weekly service, and it's compulsion or guilt that motivate people to attend. But not in a liberal religious congregation, and certainly not in a Unitarian Universalist fellowship like we have here in San Miguel. Yet here we are, gathered in person or on Zoom week after week. Why do we do this? You know, it, it's not all roses. Not everything is to our personal liking. What's shared is, may not always be what you believe. We don't agree on every idea. And yes, there are people we find difficult. So coming here requires some discipline sometimes. Lots of people have given up on going to church or to temple or to whatever they call the gathering place in their tradition. They've simply decided they don't need it in their life. You know, recent polls show that there has been a dramatic decrease in those who identify themselves as part of any kind of religious tradition. In fact, when asked the question about religious affiliation, the largest growing group is nuns. And I don't mean N-U-N-S, I mean N-O-N-E-S. <laughs> Some of those folks will tell you that it's because of their difficult experience with the religion in which they were raised. Others will recite for you a list of crimes and atrocities that have been committed through the ages in the name of religion. Still others will proclaim that science has refuted all sacred texts, and they conclude, why bother? They conclude they have no need for this weekly gathering in their lives. Now, I don't disagree with some of their premises. Many of us have scars from being raised in religions that judged us as sinners. And it's certainly true that heinous crimes have been and are still being committed in the name of religion. And I don't disagree that biblical explanations of the world may no longer commend themselves to a modern scientific mind. However, I do believe the conclusion they draw that therefore we as individuals no longer need this weekly gathering is not correct. I believe we need it just as much as our forebears of biblical times did. It's not enough to be an ethical person. It's not enough to have a regular private spiritual practice. Without this coming together as a beloved community, there's something missing in our lives. Sometimes when I go to a social gathering, I get outed as a minister. And sometimes there's someone there who feels they need to challenge what I do. Now I've been doing this for a pretty long time, so I'm familiar with the bait the minister at the cocktail party game. And this is generally not the best place to discuss religion. So I usually try to change the subject. But when that anti-minister, anti-church person assaults me with, give me one good reason why I should come to your church or fellowship or whatever you call it, I often can't resist taking the bait. So this morning I'm going to do that. I want to tell you what I think are the good reasons to come to this service every week, either in person or by Zoom. And now I've got to admit, 
as you're here one way or another, this is a bit of preaching to the choir, as they say. But nonetheless, I think we need to be, remind ourselves of a few things from time to time. And especially after having gone through this time of separation and isolation, it's a good time to focus maybe on why we do this. So let's start by answering the question of why should we come here or tune in on Zoom on a Sunday morning by saying there's not just one good reason, there are many. And actually for different folks and for the same folks at different times in their lives, one of those reasons will be more important than another. The readings you heard and participated in and the hymns we sang this morning get at some of those reasons. But here's my checklist. We need the church community for mutual support. In good times and in bad times and even in those times in between. In true religious community, the mutual support that we provide to each other as we travel life's journeys is critical. We're connected in our giving and in our receiving from each other in so many ways, in ways we don't even recognize. We easily recognize the needs of those who are ill or those who've lost a loved one. But there are many more subtle, what we call intimacy needs that are being met in a gathering like this one. The need to make or take in some music together or just to relate to another person in an honest and open way or the need to share a bit of your story and to be accepted for who you are. You may say that I can find support elsewhere or that I, I can help out a neighbor without having to be part of a congregation, and that's all true. It's not the same, though. The connections here have their basis in tradition, in faith, in spiritual depth. There's something that pulls us to be here, to be there, I should say, for people that we might not otherwise do, to connect with people who we would not otherwise meet and who probably will bring extraordinary gifts to our lives. Here our giving comes from a deeper place, and that's felt by the receiver. We are in a long-term relationship here, and we know that if we are here for a while, that there will be times when we are givers and other times when we are receivers, and we will feel okay about that. One week, we'll be sending an email or a card to a member who's struggling with an illness. And perhaps the very next week, we're receiving one of sympathy for a lost family member. A person facing cancer treatment once said this to me. This is tough, he said. I know I need the support of others. And that's what I find here. These are the people I want around me as I travel this journey. I've always been a giver, and it is hard to be a receiver. But somehow, in this community, I can be. And right now, I need to be. We sometimes sing words, from you I receive to you I give, together we share and by this we live. That captures the first part of the reasons to be part of this congregation. But that's certainly not the only reason. The next reason is this is a place of learning and growth, of formation for each of us, as the, forming us as the person or growing us into the person that we want to be. And not just for ourselves, for those children who we will soon hopefully be able to welcome back in our congregation. That's why I love those words from Anne Lamott, why she makes her son Sam go to church. The truth is that this is something that is not done once and our goal accomplished. As A. Powell Davies reminds us, we need to be reminded again and again to be connected to the best part of ourselves. We need to be goaded 
to do that. And here you will be. This is a place of learning, but you don't graduate from this place. You don't ever complete the course. Each Sunday adds something new or renews something old. One of the things that makes this work is its regularity. In another one of Anne Lamott's books, she put it this way. I go to church every Sunday, which is like going to the gas station once a week and really, really filling up. I can lose resolve, get fed up with people, get stressed. When I arrive at church and I'm greeted by f the familiar face of another, many of whom I know their stories and their courage and their commitment, I can feel my tank fill up. What happens here at the level of, is it the level of the brain, of course? It's surely at the level of the heart. And also, if you allow me to say, at the level of the soul. And by that I mean we embrace mystery. Hopefully, here we will help you to find and engage in whatever spiritual practice is right for you. Your way of prayer or meditation. As much as this is a place to spur us into action, it's also a place to let go of your weekly checklist or political disagreements and find a place of Sabbath rest and renewal. A place of spiritual grounding within ourselves as well as within our community. Here you're invited not only into deeper connections to others, but deeper connection to yourself. And that's really the third reason. And fourth, we also very much need a gathered community for meaningful collective efforts. The Reverend Mark Morrison Reed put it this way, the religious community is essential, for alone our vision is too narrow to see all that must be seen, and our strength too limited to do all that we must do. But together our vision widens and our strength is renewed. It's in community that our lives truly become meaningful. Anne Lamott put it this way in the reading that Paula shared this morning. A human life is like a single letter in the alphabet. It can meaningless be meaningless or it can be part of great meaning. We need each other to spell the words that our own community, the greater community, and the world need to hear. We need your letter to spell justice, your letter to spell service, your letter to spell ministry, your letter to spell love, your letter to spell welcome. There are so many ways that together we can be meaningful. What is so clear about this fellowship is that it wants to make a difference in the world, in the community, and in the lives of each other. It seems to me that today many people live very disconnected lives. They fail to see the need for the community of a fellowship, the need to engage deeply, exploring what truly is the ground of their being. They say it's a waste of time and they're too busy. They know all the answers and don't need interaction with others to determine where they're going. They really have no compass. They often choose superficial lives and even when things are going well, they never seem quite satisfied. They vacillate on moral decisions or they take the easy, momentarily popular road. For many of them, the Tao, D-O-W, is the Tao, T-A-O. Personal economic gain seems to be their guiding philosophy. Yet their accomplishments don't bring them the joy that they thought they might. They often feel alone and find it hard to trust others. They never find that place of fuller and richer life because they lack the connections and are looking in all the wrong places. But then there's the person who lives a very different life. The person 
does not have all the answers, and they know that, but is willing to engage with the questions. She hears the call of conscience. He comes to church because he needs to be called time and time again to his best self. In both gathered worship and personal times of reflection, they strive to connect to that deeper place of fullness, of truth, of love, that can serve as their compass on their life's journey. Their lives are not without challenges, but they meet those challenges standing on firm ground with courage and love and trust that things will work out. They feel the support of others on their journey and they take joy in serving others and engaging with others in serving the greater community. They feel connected to others. There is a simple kind of joy in their life. Their ongoing quest for those deep connections, both of intimacy and of ultimacy, make their lives worth living. You know, I think sometimes we think of ourselves as so advanced over those in the past or even who today hold views that we might think of as superstitious beliefs, who explain the world in ways that don't conform to our scientific understanding. We think of ourselves as unlike them. But I suggest to you that at the level that matters most, we are not. Our yearnings, our desires, our need for each other, for beloved community, for deep spiritual nurturing, and for the inspiration to do good in the world are exactly the same. For those in the past, the gathering on a Sabbath was a critical part of all they were and all they did. And I worry that too many have, as they say, thrown out the baby with the bathwater. No matter your theology, no matter what you claim is ultimate or true, this gathering of community that binds us together will enrich and bless your life, uphold you when you need it, spur you on to good works, remind you of the person you want to be, and bring you some peace and spiritual renewal. Smug as we can be about ancient beliefs or those of present day religions that look foolish to us, we are on the very same journey. In our tradition, a journey always new, yet ancient too. We are here to sing together, to sing out praises for that journey and to walk that path together. So will you join me in singing out praises for the journey? It's hymn number 295. Please rise as you're able and join Malcolm. <laughs> 